Hey there, this lovely manhua is titled, Looking for the Villainous Whom I Spent My First Time With. If you love stories like this, please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you'll never miss the next episode. The party hall bustled with elegant ladies and distinguished gentlemen, each adorned with a mask, as per the theme of the masquerade ball. The air was filled with chatter and laughter, punctuated by the occasional greeting between friends and acquaintances. The guests' attention turned to the talented musicians, their fingers dancing across the strings of their instruments to create mesmerizing melodies. Whispers of admiration could be heard amongst the crowd, marveling at the skill it took to produce such captivating music. A spirited voice cut through the chatter as a lady exclaimed, Bravo! Her eyes sparkled with admiration as she praised the musician's talent, declaring it a true blessing. Various drinks were being served, and everyone noticed one lady who cheered loudly, declaring that they would all eventually die. She urged everyone to embrace life without regrets and to enjoy the moment. All eyes were on her, fascinated by her unconventional drinking style and bold attitude. In a surprising move, she poured the remaining wine over her head, leaving everyone bewildered. They couldn't help but wonder what was going on with the lady, as her actions suggested she was living as if she had been given a second chance at life. Little did they know, it wasn't her second life at all. It was actually her twentieth. Woo-hoo, she sure is enjoying life then. Liberata Bernadel, the youngest daughter of the Bernadel Marquis family, stood out with her striking green eyes and vibrant orange hair. Despite her aristocratic background, she defied expectations, especially as she celebrated her 20th birthday in a rather unconventional manner. In the pages of The Misadventures of Leonie, a novel celebrated for its sweet romance and thrilling cider-like twists, Liberata Bernadel emerges as the unexpected villainess. Amidst the charming backdrop of the story, she stands out with her cunning demeanor and unpredictable actions. As the plot unfolds, she finds herself in a pivotal moment when another gentleman invites her to share a drink. With a sly smile, she agrees. As a devoted reader of The Misadventures of Leonie, Liberata Bernadelle found herself immersed in the gripping tale, particularly the scene where the villainess meets her demise late at night. With a sense of relief, she removed her glasses, remarking on the satisfyingly merciless fate of the character. Drifting off to sleep, she never expected to wake up in the very body of the wicked woman she had just read about. Walking out the door as her friend asked if she was all right and she said she needed to calm down. Suddenly, a distraught woman burst into the room, her voice filled with panic as she lamented that her cat was not breathing. In her distress, she turned to Liberata, seizing her arm with an aggressive grip and accusing her of being responsible for the unfortunate situation. Amidst the chaos, others in the tea house began to speculate if Liberata's upset demeanor was due to her fiancé proposing to Leonie. Angered by the accusation and bewildered by the sudden turn of events, Liberata vehemently denied any knowledge of such a proposal. Suddenly, a wave of horror swept through the room as all the ladies began vomiting blood, their agonized groans filling the air. Shocked and overwhelmed before she could intervene, the scene descended into a blur of chaos and bloodshed, leaving her stunned and reeling with the weight of the unfolding tragedy. Liberata stood in front of everyone, looking dirty and without showing any emotions. They were going to kill her in front of everyone because she did bad things. They said she was the one who hurt her friend's cat and made some ladies sick at the tea party by giving them poison. They said she did these things because she was angry that her fiancé wanted to marry her friend. Then they said she was going to die for what she did. Lieb's friend, standing with the young man who had read out her crimes, shouted Lieb's name sadly. That was how Liberata was killed. As she died, she felt maybe it was better this way. But as soon as she thought that, she was back to square one where she started in this crazy situation. She thought to herself, this must be my 20th time coming back as the same villain in the same story. That's insane. The young man beside her was shocked, thinking. Each time, she was caught red-handed committing crimes and was sentenced to death. Once at a tea party, everyone got sick from poison, and she was given a death sentence again. Another time, even though she stayed home, evidence showed she had ordered a hit, leading to another death sentence. They accused her of murder and running away, resulting in yet another death sentence. It seemed like no matter what, it always ended with her facing the ultimate punishment. Woo, do you think she can escape dying because no matter what she did, 
does she still end up getting such a penalty? Liberata was furious. She shouted that she couldn't even harm a bug, let alone hurt a cat or a person. The others couldn't help but stare at her, calling her shameless. They whispered that if she thought wearing a mask would hide her identity, they'd rather not associate with her. In the midst of the gossip, a lady with blonde hair excused herself from the group and approached Liberata. Liberata, defiant, yelled that she was going to die anyway, so she might as well live however she pleased. Seeing her, Liberata grinned and offered another glass, but the lady warned her to stop, fearing that people would misunderstand her actions. Liberata reminded the lady with blonde hair that everyone already called her names. Did she really want to be seen around someone like Liberata? Despite being constantly hurt by Liberata throughout the 19th round, the lady, who was the protagonist of the story Misadventures of Leonie Almez, stubbornly stayed by her side. No matter how many times Liberata made a scene about not being at a crime scene but still being blamed, Leonie always testified in her favor. Whether it was being accused when she wasn't there or being charged with murder, Leonie testified about their alibis and travels together. Yet Liberata was always proven guilty in the end. Well, the thing is that what's destined will definitely happen, you know? It got to a point where people felt sorry for Leonie for being so loyal to a wicked woman like Liberata. Leonie tried to persuade Liberata to leave the party, insisting that she was drunk and they should go. But Liberata refused, saying she wanted to continue partying because she was in a great mood. She caressed Leonie's face and promised that she would only drink for today and then quit. As Liberata watched her friend leave, she couldn't shake the feeling that while she wouldn't do anything wrong, Leonie would still suffer because of her. However, there was one silver lining. If Leonie left the ballroom now, she would meet the man who was going to protect her from Liberata. Liberata found some relief in that thought. Oh, she really cares about her friend. Watching couples dance and hold each other's hands, Liberata looked away and shamelessly took bottles of alcohol. As she moved, she accidentally bumped into a lady, causing her bottle to fall and roll away. Both ladies stared at her and asked her to be more careful, to which she apologized before chasing after her bottle. The annoyance continued as the bottle didn't stop rolling until it reached a man's shoe. Looking up, Liberata saw a tall man with black hair, also wearing a black coat. Wow, that seemed like the male lead. But is she supposed to meet him or Leonie was to meet him first? She looked at him, muttering that his voice sounded familiar as he asked if she was okay. He reached out his hands to help her up, saying she must be drunk. His fierce red eyes didn't leave her. She bluffed asking him what he was talking about, insisting she wasn't drunk. In the dimly lit kingdom, a young man untied his tie, sweat dripping down his face. He glanced at Liberata, who lay flat on the bed in her nightwear, with all her jewelry scattered on the floor and her mask off. Wait, could it be that they were intimate? Suddenly she shouted, sitting upright on the bed. He asked if she'd lost her mind. She turned to him, noticing he was still wearing his mask and stuttered in response. Liberata stared at him as he returned her gaze coldly. She shouted, demanding to know who he was, while covering herself with a pillow. He remained silent, not uttering a word. Liberata yelled at him not to come any closer. He replied calmly, saying it seemed she didn't remember anything, and neither did he undress her because she had taken her clothes off herself. He advised her that it would be better if she tried to remember on her own. As Liberata flashed back to what actually happened, she remembered the moment when the guy had said she was drunk, and she had claimed to be fine but was stumbling. He had held on to her, telling her she couldn't even walk and asking where her carriage was, but she had pulled away angrily, demanding to know who he was. She lamented, saying he was so tall like a giraffe. Liberata, looking at the ground, saw that it was shaking. She held on to him tightly, asking why the ground was suddenly shaking and if it was because of shoddy construction. She yelled, saying she had to leave and that she needed help. Suddenly, tears filled her eyes as she said she didn't want to die in pain. He carried her in his arms, and they stared at each other. He asked where she wanted to go, but she yelled back, demanding to know what he was even asking. If not the exit, then where else? Ignoring the stares of everyone around them, he took her away. Both of them were shameless and didn't care what others thought. Liberata shivered as she recalled what she had actually done. She apologized to him, but then suddenly yelled again, expressing her disbelief at how she managed to remove her clothes. He sighed and reassured her that he didn't undress her, but she struggled to imagine that she had taken off her dress herself. Her mind flashed back again to the moment after they had exited the shoddy construction. The young man asked if she was feeling safe now, 
Liberata replied saying it was too hot and she felt like she might die from burning instead. He'll wonder why she's always talking of dying. He knew he needed to find her carriage immediately and get her away from there. He asked what her name was and she replied, questioning the point of him knowing the name of a woman who was meant to die anyway. Confused by her response, he wondered what she meant. Deciding to tell him since he wanted to know, she said her name was Liberata Bernadette, staring at him with a slight grin. He responded that in that case, he would go find the coachman of the Bernadette family. However, he was interrupted when she entered the water towel, saying she had managed to escape the shoddy construction, but now she felt like she was about to burn alive. She expressed her frustration, stating that she was sick and tired of it and that she would have to survive this time. Suddenly, she shouted, claiming she was burning again. Confused, he pointed out that the weather was too chilly for her to be burning. He urged her to take his hands and come out of there. He knelt before her, reaching out his hands, which seemed really romantic to Liberata. Oh, looks just like two couples and the guy proposing. She grabbed onto him, expressing her confusion about understanding romantic gestures. Then she surprised him by kissing him passionately. As they kissed, she completed her statement by admitting that judging by his looks, he was just her type. She kissed him again, and he couldn't help but respond to her kisses. Back in the present, he reminded her that he had to stop her from taking off her clothes in the fountain garden and had dragged her all the way to the castle. She shouted in embarrassment, apologizing and acknowledging that she had caused a big commotion at the ball. Suddenly, she asked where she was. He replied, saying she was in Cygnus Castle. The Lord of Cygnus Castle and the Grand Duke of the Newton Empire, Jerlac Cygnus, held power comparable to that of the Emperor. He was the male protagonist of the story Misadventures of Leonie, the man who put her on the execution table to protect his beloved woman, Leonie. Liberata was shocked to hear she was in the castle of that man, Jerlac Cygnus. Terrified, she asked if he was an associate of Jerlac Cygnus. Panicking as she wondered if she was going to die for causing a disturbance, she feared she might face execution by guillotine, hanging, or even being shot. Really? Is that how scared she's become? Well, that's expected of someone who died in the hands of the one she's in his castle presently. Liberata's frightened expression betrayed her fear as she clutched her neck anxiously. He approached her, holding her hands tightly, and asked what she was so afraid of. As she stared into his eyes, he removed his mask, revealing himself to be Yerlak Cygnus. He assured her that he wouldn't let her die. Woo! That's crazy. So she's actually been with him all this while. Liberata was so shocked that she stuttered as she called his name. She asked why he was here, and he replied by asking if it was strange for him to be on his own house. Without realizing it, she blurted out that if it was according to plan, then he should have met Leonie in front of the ball entrance door. Jerlak was confused and asked who she was talking about. Liberata muttered, wondering what was going on right now. Jerlak responded that he didn't know what she was talking about, but all he wanted to know right now was about her, not someone else. Woo, was that a flirting line? He asked Liberata what kind of person she is. She sighed, saying he must be interested in her because she keeps spouting nonsense. He explained that sometimes she acts like a young lady— then suddenly like a lewd person and other times like a shaman, as she did when she told him who he was supposed to meet. Liberata told him she was really nothing special, just a friend of Almaz's, the young lady Leonie. So she felt like she was just a pebble that his excellency might kick on the ground, which makes her just an ordinary girl. She told him she must have been too drunk. Getting up from the bed, she said she'll get going while he watched her from the bed as she made to leave. He smirked, saying she sounded like a character from a book. Well, indeed she is, isn't she? He said that because people don't usually start talking about themselves by talking about their friends. Someone who thinks for themselves has emotions and feels sensations. So her answer wasn't a typical human one. She replied, saying she didn't know any of these, questioning if this place was actually for her or if the emotions and sensations were really hers. Scratching her head while standing at the door, she expressed her confusion and fear. He reached out to her immediately, holding onto her hands tightly as she stared with teary eyes. He asked if it hurt, and she replied, saying it was scary. He responded by saying that if she was that scared, then he would give her a chance to check if she was real and whether the emotions and feelings were truly hers. Liberata thought about Leonie, who was sitting on the bed with Jerlac beside her, and wondered if she was okay. She had heard that Leonie almost died this time. 
She recalled how Lanny had mentioned drinking poison at the tea party before, and how her beloved cat had died. Liberata considered it fortunate that Grand Duke Cygnus was by her side because if he hadn't been there, Leonie might have been killed already. And why? Because of her, whom they called a vicious woman. Liberata opened her eyes immediately and was asked by the maids if she was awake. She screamed, covering herself with a blanket as it seemed she was naked this time around. She was informed that His Excellency was waiting for her, which surprised her wondering why he was waiting for her. Then she suddenly recalled the accident that occurred last night. The moment Yerlach said he would give her a chance to check if she was real and if the emotions she was feeling were truly hers, she grabbed his shirt and engaged him in a kiss. He didn't see it coming but responded passionately. Both of them were swept away by the moment and their romance continued all the way to the bed. Oh, wow. Would she still say this is a mistake? The thought of the whole thing was literally driving her crazy now, and she found herself yelling at herself, wondering why she did that. The maid smiled, telling her she didn't need to regret drinking because she didn't look swollen in any way at all. Rather, she looked beautiful enough. Walking through the hallway, all dressed in a blue designer dress, she felt it was ridiculous that she, the villainess, and the male lead had slept together. It all felt quite unbelievable to her. Really ridiculous, where does that even happen? Reaching the dining table, he greeted her, expressing his desire to stay by her side until she woke up, but he had a lot of work to do. She sat down quietly, wondering what was going to happen next. In the previous 19 attempts, no matter what she did, she ended up being falsely accused and dying. She wondered if she would end up dying with an absurd false accusation again this time. She pondered if perhaps this was a new route to survival, should she grab onto this person for survival or maybe just push him away? The uncertainty weighed heavily on her mind as she contemplated her next move. Jerlak complimented her, saying the dress looked good on her. He turned to Sir Ori and the other servants, acknowledging that it pays to choose carefully, and it was Sir Ori who gave him this good idea. Sir Ori was Lord Jerlak's aide, known for being brilliant and professional. Jerlak pointed out that he wanted her to choose, but he didn't want to disturb her sleep. He asked if she liked it. Liberata thought to herself that it wasn't something to decide on a whim. It could be the discovery of a hopeful route, but she also felt it could be a much more terrible route. She decided not to get ahead of themselves, so for now, there shouldn't be a romantic atmosphere. She stated without caring that she wasn't interested in dresses and stuff, adding that she didn't like noise and loved staying home, so she had no reason to be interested in clothes and going out. At this point, Jerlak got confused, wondering if she was the same girl who was partying all night. Well, it sure is the he-same girl, really hilarious. He reminded her of how she seemed to enjoy herself yesterday and asked if that was the case, then what did she like exactly? Liberata was speechless, pondering what she actually liked. Finally, she replied, saying she liked things that couldn't be obtained with wealth and power. She claimed she wanted simplicity, physical and mental health. At this point, Jerlak was totally lost thinking it should rather be luxury, self-destructive behavior, and pleasure, because yesterday was all about her indulging in such activities. She told him not to try to appeal to her using his wealth and power to give her gifts like land or sea. The servants were surprised, murmuring to themselves that she seemed like a peculiar woman. Liberata, deep down, felt sorry for having to spout nonsense. She kept going on and on about animals, which wasn't even related to the matter at hand. She thought to herself that she had to stall for time with idle chatter before they parted ways. She looked at the meal, smiling mischievously and asking what the menu was, as it tasted like it was going to give her a healthy rush. Jerlak stared, somewhat phased, and replied that it was bread made with freshly squeezed milk and sea turtle soup for breakfast. Liberata thought about how sad the cows must have been and how pitiful the dead turtle would look. She glared, saying that's why it tasted... Jerlak interrupted her by coughing, and both of them stared at each other. Liberata wondered to herself why the atmosphere suddenly felt better. Jerlak said since she wasn't interested in dresses at all, he asked if it was okay for him to give her a dress for the next ball. Liberata was totally surprised and asked what he was on about. He replied, saying she had just said herself that choosing dresses didn't interest her. He wondered if she said that because she didn't like Sir Ori's taste. At this rate, the employees were in crisis. Liberata couldn't help but agree that she liked the idea. Jerlak smiled, saying it meant she would definitely attend the next ball. Then she asked a very ridiculous question. 
With me? Yeah, sure, if not you, then who? He sent her off in a carriage, waving with an umbrella while it rained as they went off. She stared through the window, thinking she had just made a promise for the next meeting without thinking. She turned to Sir Ori, who was sent as an escort for her, and told him if he would mind telling His Excellency that she couldn't attend the ball due to unforeseen circumstances. He apologized, saying he didn't think he could. She frowned, thinking to herself that, as expected of the male protagonist, he was good at flirting with women. She thought about last night's event, touching her lips lustfully, considering that maybe he wasn't as heartless as she thought. Perhaps this time she had a chance to survive. Just then, they heard a noise outside, and Ori took a look. She asked him what happened, and he said there must have been a disturbance. She looked out herself and saw some men maltreating an old woman calling her an unlucky old hag. They accused her of not knowing that a lot of carriage accidents happen on rainy roads. One of the men dragged the old lady onto the road, asking if she knew which family the carriage belonged to. Liberata was provoked, putting herself in the old woman's situation. She imagined how she was maltreated and accused of trying to kill Miss Laney. She expressed her concern, saying that even though he may act affectionate now, once she's out of favor with the Grand Duke, she'll end up like that old woman too. She took an umbrella and got out of the carriage, telling him to go. However, he argued, saying he was ordered to escort her safely to her doorstep and there's still a little bit left. She turned, glaring tenaciously, and asked if he meant that in order to save a young woman that the Grand Duke is fond of, he would harm a harmless and frail old woman. She felt disgusted, yelling that there are things in this world that shouldn't be done, no matter how much money or power one has. She went off, leaving her words ringing in Ori's ears and he couldn't help but call her a truly extraordinary young lady. The men, upon seeing Liberata coming at them, quickly fled, leaving the old woman behind on the road. Liberata asked the old woman if she was okay. The old woman called her a very passionate young lady and mentioned that Liberata may not realize she's the most pitiful one of them all. At this point, Liberata was confused. The old lady with red eyes looked into her eyes and said she would give her a prophecy. She unexpectedly and swiftly grabbed Liberata by her blue neck ribbon, which took Liberata by surprise. The old woman then told her that this was apparently her 20th attempt, leaving Liberata wondering how she knew that. Really surprising, I must say. The old woman told her that the world would be destroyed if she didn't put everything back in its place in her 20th life, so she should remember her words. As Liberata turned to ask what she meant by, the world will be destroyed, the same world of misadventures of Leonie, the woman was already gone. A young lady yelled, asking what was going on, which caught Liberata's attention. It was Eklar, Liba's exclusive maid. She ran to her, asking where she was coming from because she was worried sick about her. Liberata apologized, which shocked Eklar, who was like, the lady apologized to her? Eklar informed her about Lady Almaz waiting for her since morning, and she's worried too. Liberata thought to herself that Eklar was a child heavily mistreated by Liberata before she got possessed into Libe's body. They hurried home, and on the way, Liberata asked Eklar, since she knows much about romance stories, what does it mean that the world of the book gets destroyed? Eklar said sadly that it means that the main character was going to die. Liberata was astounded, thinking if the misadventures of Leonie disappears— just then, she heard Leoni calling out to her across the road with bandages all over her body, asking what took her so long. But suddenly they were shocked to see a carriage with a black horse running aggressively and heading towards Leoni. She didn't realize why, because her attention was on Liberata, who was across the road. The thought of Leoni, the main character, dying drove Liberata crazy. She was so determined to save her, even though Leoni was smiling at her without seeing her death approaching. Liberata shouted, Leoni! trying to warn her of the danger rushing towards her. Can Liberata really save Leonie? And how can she stop the world from destroying instead? Liberata and her maid had shocked expressions on their faces as the two men ran closer in their direction. One of them asked what was going on and why the horse exploded, warning Liberata to be careful. Liberata ran as fast as she could, rushing over to Leonie and asking her if she was okay. Leonie, looking scared, begged Liberata to help. Liberata, looking at her, was shocked and taken aback. Finally, Leonie opened up, saying that she's been having strange experiences since last night. Recalling how she was welcomed home by her maids, with one of them saying she was back home quite early today, Leonie told them she was tired and was going to wash up and go to bed. 
Just then, her maid immediately exclaimed, drawing her attention, telling Miss Laney she had a cut on her face. Laney immediately ordered a bandage, and the cut was attended to, and her cut was closed. That same night, she continued saying she tried sleeping, but then she was shocked to see a typhoon in her room. Fear didn't let her stay. She actually ran out. This morning, her servant told her that they'd checked the security of the mansion very well, and other than the broken mirror, everything was intact. Apparently, there wasn't even a typhoon last night. Lanny continued explaining that as she was trying to leave the mansion, her maid was concerned, saying everything seemed strange and ominous. And it's better she stays at home and rests today. But then Miss Lanny assured her, saying she shouldn't worry, smiling brightly, and said she was going to be back safely, calling it a promise. Liberata and her maid, listening to her story, were shocked. Liberata shouted, saying she knew that last line she just said, saying it's a line the protagonist says in a novel before going to their death. Concerned, she said Lanny almost died for real, yelling that she should go home right now. Surprised, Lanny stared at them before pointing out that these wounds actually happened at home, and Liberata agreed, saying that means location is actually not the problem. Lanny's countenance changed immediately as she confessed telling them she actually ran away from home this morning because she was scared, but then this happened outside too. Feeling terrified, Leoni asked Liberata, her friend, if she thought she was cursed. Shocked and confused, Liberata didn't reply. Rather, her mind was preoccupied with what to do next as she remembered that old lady's words, saying that if she didn't put everything back in its place in her 20th life, this life would be destroyed. Her thoughts drifted to where Jerlak was, and she told herself that she just needed to push him away. Just then, Leonie interrupted, saying she didn't need to do anything. Liberata asked Leonie what if she told her she had a soulmate, but before he met her he made a mistake and slept with her friend one night. But of course he's not been interested in her friend at all since he met her. Shocked, Leonie disagreed, admitting that she would hate that. Liberata immediately sparked, asking why she'd hate that, saying that she meant she could actually see why Leonie would hate that, but then that's his past, actually, before he met her, and it was just one night. Woo, what exactly is Liberata trying to do? She wants to force her to accept a man with such a past? It's really not done anywhere. If you were in Leonie's situation, would you agree? Surprised, Leonie cut her short, saying that's not true, and that it's not like they were in an animal world. She said if she found out something like that, well, doesn't it mean that her lifelong love would disappear? Liberata practically overreacted, asking Lanny what if the man loves her incredibly and that if she doesn't get with that man, she might die. Lanny, almost getting pissed, asked her friend what she was talking about, trying to confirm if Liberata is truly saying that she has to meet a man she doesn't love anymore just so she can be alive. She questioned about the man's feelings, saying it's more like he's been used. Lanny is actually right, like it's not fair at all. She asked Liberata what the friend's heart was feeling as they looked at it. Just then, it actually dawned on Liberata what she was trying to do as she asked what the friend's heart was feeling. Leonie gently told her friend that people's feelings shouldn't be played with like that. Just then, all excited, Leonie asked Liberata what kind of new novel setting was, saying it was so interesting. Her maid too joined excitedly, saying she was curious too as it sounded interesting. Liberata, all pissed, just brushed it off, saying it was nothing. Well, yes, that's Lanny Almaz's personality, very nice, right? Remembering how Lanny reached out to her when she was imprisoned in her previous life, Lanny came searching for her in the prison, calling out to Lieb. She asked if she could hear her, saying she came to meet her secretly without telling Jerlak, begging her friend to look at her face at least, even if she's in danger, even if everyone disagrees with her, Lanny will always be there for her. Feeling sad, Liberata told her to go away and that she shouldn't be getting involved with her as it was very dangerous. Liberata called herself a sinner who tried to kill Lanny, but then her friend, angered, reached out touching the prison wall, saying she knew it was not true, but that didn't happen. Angered, Liberata yelled, telling Lanny to stop lying. Back to reality, Liberata knows that Lanny has such a straightforward personality that can be seen. She knew it was definitely not going to be easy to convince her friend after all, Liberata told herself she just has to do something urgently. She can't let Lanny find out what happened last night. Lanny, staring at her friend concerned, asked if Liberata was worried about her, and she admitted it, saying of course she was worried about her, which was obviously a bit surprising to Lanny. 
Liberata then remembers that this is the moment right after she possesses her because before that, Liberata Bernadette was quite mean, like very mean. She remembers how she treated Leonie in the past. She was typically a mean villainess, using Leonie anyhow as she pleases, completely rude to the maid too, who was surprised, confessing there were many times she thought Liberata was mean, but then it now feels like it's just her narrow-minded misunderstandings. The maid knew how she particularly said her name reminded her of a dog on a leash. Ignoring all that, Liberata told Leonie that yes, she's really worried, and it can actually be seen on her face. She told Leonie to stay away from the Newton Empire noble girls. The maid was surprised, and Leonie, confused, asked why immediately. Well, they were the group that framed Leonie alongside Liberata, and above all, they are the most stuck-up people in the empire. Liberata wished she could just block them from her life, and Leonie wouldn't know a single thing. Concerned like a big sister, she affectionately held Leonie's cheeks, telling her not to associate with useless rumors or gossip, and that when it comes to relationships, quality is more important than quantity. Just then, Liberata's parents happily entered the house, calling her name. Liberata, surprised to see them, watched as Leonie greeted them happily. Her father, clearly happy, called Liberata his little flower and their family's hope. Liberata's mom, very excited, told Leonie she knew her daughter could do it, while her father announced that they knew she was at the ball last night with the Grand Duke Cygnus. Oops, they found out. Annoyed, Liberata grabbed Leonie's cheeks tightly, reminding her that she told her never to mind or associate with rumors or gossip, yelling that it doesn't matter even if they come from someone's parents. The maid, shocked, remarked that Lady Liberata was actually worse than she thought. Liberata's dad, still happy, told her they believed in her. Trying to change the subject, Liberata mentioned that of course Jurlac helped her just a bit at the ball. Feeling sad and careless, she realized there were more than a few people who saw her there. Leonie, surprised, asked what they were talking about, but Liberata told her not to bother and come with her instead. Liberata told her parents she was going shopping, then, holding Leonie's hand as they left, she tried explaining herself to her friend, saying she was drunk last night and that Grand Duke Cygnus, who happened to be passing by, helped her. She added that they parted ways after that considering that people only saw her receiving help at the ball and nothing more than that. Lanny just responded, saying she was looking forward to the next ball. Meanwhile, her dad, feeling happy and sad at the same time, asked if he should start getting ready to marry her off. Her mom interrupted, suggesting that their daughter only said he helped out, so maybe it's actually not a big deal. Annoyed, he yelled, saying no. He remembered when some young men talked about seeing his daughter with another guy. He got really mad and attacked the guy, demanding to know why he was talking about his daughter like that. The frightened young man had to confess, admitting that she was with Jerlac Cygnus, the Grand Duke of Newton. Surprised, he started blushing so much before the man ran away. Her father, excited, told her mom that this news had already spread everywhere. He continued excitedly, saying that the young masters of all families were paying attention to their daughter, claiming she's the woman who brought down the Grand Duke. Her dad, feeling happy, said she's finally going to choose a groom. Meanwhile, the Liberata they knew was very stubborn and didn't even like men. There was a time she said she wasn't sad about not having a dog anymore because now guys would be her dogs. So they're not actually wrong in being this happy. All parents with good intentions would react like that. Finally, their daughter seems to be falling for someone. Her parents were very happy at the thought that the Duke might soon become their son-in-law. In the Duke's manner, Gerlach felt like he could sense all eyes on him. Turning to his assistant, Ori, he remarked that it seemed like the news had spread throughout the social circle very quickly. Ori suggested that perhaps someone had witnessed them together. Still trying to understand, Ori questioned Gerlach about what they did last night in public. Gerlach only responded, admitting that he had been careless and shouldn't have done what he did his clearly keeping Ori in suspense, but then he must not hear everything from him right. Jerlak, looking worried, said he needed to figure out a way to fix everything, which confused Ori even more. Ori asked why he wanted to fix anything. With a determined look, Jerlak said he was going to visit Liberata's parents in the near future, mainly to tell them directly that the rumors were all false. Ori, even more confused, asked if the rumors were truly not true, which made Jerlak turn and look at him, questioning if he even believed such ridiculous rumors. Jerlak then added, asking if Ori believed he was a cold-blooded person as icy as ice. 
Ori, surprised in his heart, realized that Jerlak was talking about this particular rumor. At Mutant's boutique, Leonie Eckler and the seller couldn't help but compliment how perfect the dress was for Liberata. They noticed that the length was just right, and Liberata looked beautiful in the dress. Lanny asked why she wasn't buying a ball gown instead. Deep down, Liberata knew she couldn't keep wearing the clothes that Cygnus gave her in front of them. Liberata said to the seller that she would take the one she was wearing, and Eklar offered to wrap the dress she came in with nicely. But Liberata interrupted, saying she didn't need it anymore. She ordered them to throw away the clothes she was wearing. In the dressing room, Lanny couldn't help but feel like she would be really overdressed and said she wanted to wear something else. Liberata was sitting on the couch, overhearing their conversation. The female dress stylist in the room disagreed with Lanny's statement, telling her that she just needed to try it on once and she would change her mind. The other lady added, saying, it's perfect for her fairy-like image. They said Liberata had excellent dress taste, and she nodded agreeing while going through the magazine in her hands closely. Feeling pressured, Leonie called out to Liberata saying she was just going to the ball to watch, but this was a bit too much. Liberata, already provoked, asked Lanny what she was talking about, yelling that it's the girl's first meeting with the Grand Duke and told her to wake up, emphasizing that it's a really important event. Lanny, feeling pissed off, yelled back, asking what exactly Liberata was trying to say, stating that whether he's the Grand Duke or not, she's absolutely not interested. Liberata, staying calm, told her friend she's always saying the same thing, wondering if he is actually her soulmate. Liberata then had a flashback of when she was in bed with Yurlak Cygnus, remembering how he was all over her and his words. He told her he didn't know what she was talking about, but at that moment, he only wanted to hear her story, not someone else's. She felt touched watching him tell her he wanted to know what kind of person Liberata Bernadette was. Convinced by Jerlak's caring and attentive nature, Liberata convinced herself, telling Leonie that she's going to change her mind when they both meet. Leonie's countenance already changed from the constant pressure coming from her friend Liberata. Leonie told her she had already met with the Grand Duke, Jerlak Cygnus. Leonie started explaining, saying that, to be honest, she was a little bit interested when she heard a handsome and capable Grand Duke had returned to the Newton Empire. She then had a flashback of how she actually met the Duke at the mask ball the other night. She wanted to meet him in person, but then she bumped into him on her way out, and staring at him, she immediately apologized. Leonie could still remember how fierce and scary his eyes and facial expression were that night. But then, looking at him, anyone could tell that he was the Grand Duke of the Rumors. It was like there couldn't be a man with a better physique or a more handsome face. Leonie, while dressed, looked at the mirror and told Liberata that even with all that handsomeness, she would never want to be with someone with such cold and scary eyes. The other two stylists chimed in, saying that's what everyone says, that he's a very scary, cold-blooded person who doesn't shed blood or tears. Liberata was surprised, realizing that Leonie had already met the Duke, but she told her friend that it was a brief meeting, adding that the Duke wouldn't want to have anything to do with her. Stirred by the unfolding events, Liberata rose from her seat, her concern for Leonie evident as she called out to her friend. Her face etched with worry, Liberata reached out to touch Leonie, confiding that she feared a terrible curse was at play. With urgency in her voice, Liberata reassured Leonie, insisting that everything would be all right once the ball had come to an end. Ha ha ha, so funny. So just because her friend doesn't like the Duke, she's now saying it's a curse. Seeking to reassure her friend, Liberata spoke in a gentle, reassuring tone. She told him that the Grand Duke isn't as terrible as he seems, she confided, hoping to ease Leonie's fears. With a knowing smile, she continued saying he actually has a surprising side to him that few have seen. Reflecting on her own experiences with the Duke, Liberata thought to herself how he was the kind of man who would help a drunk woman find her way home, patiently listening to her ramblings. He was capable of comforting a crying woman, offering solace in her time of need. Deep down, Liberata knew the Grand Duke was a compassionate soul, unable to turn a blind eye to those in need. This hidden side of him was something she hoped Lanny would come to see in time. Why do I feel like Liberata had actually fallen in love with the Grand Duke, like she's talking like a typical lover girl? So sweet but bad she's trying to push things too hard. Liberata's shoulders slumped as she lowered her head, a sadness creeping into her voice. She told her she shouldn't be so quick to judge him like that. 
Liberata cautioned Laenie, hoping to open her friend's eyes to the duke's true nature. Laenie, taken aback by Liberata's words, was about to respond when a voice cut through their conversation. Are you just bragging right now? The interloper asked, her tone skeptical. Both ladies turned to the direction where the voice was coming from, only to see a young, beautiful lady. Laenie's countenance changed, addressing her as Lady Easley. In the novel Misadventures of Laenie, she was the woman, along with Liberata, who constantly got Laenie in trouble. Even during the 19th round, she actively rejected Liberata despite committing numerous evil deeds. The owner of the shopping mall immediately welcomed Lady Easley and apologized, saying it's the first time such a problem is occurring in her business, whispering that their store is a big deal. She's the real power behind the young ladies. And that's all thanks to her parents who own the best wine business in the empire. Ignoring the proprietor's greeting, Lady Easley cut straight to the point. Are you bragging? Lady Easley, in fact, was the dangerous individual Liberata had warned against engaging. Her presence only heightened the tension in the room. Easley continued accusingly, saying Liberata spent the night with the Grand Duke Cygnus, but her words were abruptly cut off as Liberata pressed her hand firmly over Easley's mouth, feigning a smile. Liberata asked if they can have a word outside, her tone deceptively pleasant. Without waiting for a response, she dragged Easley out of the room. Once the doors and windows were securely shut, Liberata's demeanor shifted. She tightened her grip on Easley's mouth. Harshly hurting her, she said she'll close her mouth. As if she was trying to cast a spell on her, Liberata told her that whatever she must have heard doesn't matter. Inwardly, Liberata's resolve hardened. She was determined to brainwash Easley, to erase any knowledge the woman might possess about her and the Grand Duke. Liberata is the main villainess, while Easley is the sub-villainess. Both are fighting and screaming like little kids about to devour each other. Lady Easley asked Liberata what she was doing, saying she knew that Liberata was crazy. Lady Easley immediately pushed Liberata on the forehead, saying that's enough and demanding that she tell the details of all that happened. Feeling sad, Liberata said her brainwashing plan had failed. Lady Easley went on, saying that yesterday she saw it with her own eyes. At the fountain, she saw Liberata and Duke Jerlac Cygnus together, recalling how she saw them in a compromising position. Trying to brush things off, Liberata laughed loudly, asking what Lady Easley could have possibly seen in her heart. Liberata tried explaining herself, saying she drank a little too much and that's why she made a mistake. She added that she apologized to him immediately. Lady Easley, looking at her suspiciously, asked if Liberata was actually trying to say nothing happened between the two of them last night. Well, anyone would really find it hard to believe what Liberata is saying, or would you believe her? Liberata, maintaining her composure, said, Of course, nothing happened. In a mocking manner, Lady Easley laughed out loud, saying, Of course, even if something happened last night, they would just pretend it didn't. Feeling sad, Liberata told herself that she just has to because that's something that shouldn't be there. Lady Easley, now looking all serious and mean, told her it would be better to be honest from now on rather than trying to lie her way out. Wickedly, she said she can do more than Liberata can think of. She opened the door and proudly announced she's leaving. The ladies outside murmured, asking themselves who she thinks she is. Meanwhile, Lady Easley walked away looking angry and pissed, muttering about how dare Liberata even call her a damn woman. She remembered catching sight of them last night, romancing and kissing. Liberata stared at her, seeming truly scared of Lady Easley. Lady Easley tried to convince herself that it didn't happen, that they had simply drunk too much alcohol and hallucinated. Meanwhile, when the doors were closed, the two ladies, the stylists, were trying to eavesdrop on their conversation inside, but were frustrated as they couldn't hear anything. The other lady added, saying that Lady Easley actually came here because of a false rumor, and that sounded practically impossible to her. The other lady turned to Laenie, asking her if they were talking about Grand Duke Cygnus, saying she was her friend, and asked if she didn't know anything. Laenie calmly closes her eyes, saying she doesn't know anything, and she'll pretend that she doesn't know anything until Lieb says something. Laenie, looking at Liberata, knows she's a very shy person. There is more to discover in this manhua. If you enjoyed this story and you want the next part, comment the name Liberata.